over the past six weeks, we have been hearing from our missionaries and chaplains. And it's been really inspiring to hear their stories of what God has been doing in and through their ministries to the ends of the earth. Also, I want to say thank you very much for your generosity because when you give your offerings to our church, 10% go towards our chaplains and our missionaries. Thank you so much for your ongoing generosity. Today, we have asked three missionaries that we used to support but who have since returned home. And we've asked them, what are they now up to? Good morning, my name's Ruth Otridge. And I've been asked to give you an update of my future plans, but I'm going to squeeze in a few details about what's been happening in Tanzania recently. We've completed four New Testaments, and, and this is the most recent one, the Wanji New Testament. And currently, two shipments of New Testaments are on their way from Korea, I believe. We've worked on local language websites, apps in local languages, and the Jesus film has been completed in 13 languages. We're very grateful to the Lord for this progress, but it hasn't been without its challenges. More recently, it's been hard for non-citizens to get visas, and it's been my responsibility to work through the process of applying for those, as well as for caring and managing our staff. Now for my future, I've returned permanently to Australia, primarily to care for my mum and dad. But I'm also, also continuing to work for SIL Tanzania because I haven't been able to find anyone to replace me as yet. I would actually like to be able to get some part-time work here. But now doesn't seem to be a good time to be looking for work. But I remind myself of God's continued provision, remembering Jeremiah 27:11, which says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, plans for a future and a hope. I do want to say thank you so much for your support, prayerfully and financially over the years. Your support has enabled me to support translation in Tanzania, which in turn supports the churches of Tanzania and most importantly, reaches deep into the hearts of people who are normally forgotten or ignored because they um, speak minority languages. Thank you for your part in reaching them. I do pray that God blesses you richly for that. Many thank you. Many, many thank yous. G'day Rudy Creek guys. Um, John and Grace Wright here. Used to be in Camoil, uh, doing ministry up there for 13 years in the community there and outlying communities. Um, just been asked to do a little update on where are they now kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I'm finished when we came off the field um, in 2019 I finished off some, no 2018 I finished off some theological studies um, and got them done by the end of 2018 um, and then needed work so got back into school chaplaincy and still currently doing that full time um, in a couple of schools in New South Wales across the border we live in Victoria at the moment and um, yeah enjoying that but but yearning for, for something different a bit uh, yeah, I'm working part time at school too, doing teacher aid um, things with kids. I retrained a bit. Uh, the kids are doing pretty well. Um, we've got Elijah in year 10, Janara in year 8, and Manoa in year 6. Manoa's probably struggling the most. We appreciate your prayers for him. He's finding school still pretty difficult, but they've made a good adjustment in general. But they found it pretty difficult um, and very different being down here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I guess one of the things that we're always pondering is what we need to be doing uh, for the Lord, and we're we're kind of we're one of those missionary families that are not necessarily lost down here, but really struggling to find our place uh, in church in rural Victoria. 
um, for a variety of reasons. I've I've uh, gotten involved in God Squad um, motorcycle club scene ministry um, and finding that really really helpful and encouraging me. But we're always thinking, what do we need to be doing um, for the Lord? And yeah, we appreciate prayer for that. We still think that our our work in the territory is not yet finished. Um, so whether we end up there at the end of this year or further down the track, we're not really sure. But um, yeah, we'd really appreciate your prayers in, in helping us to fit in kingdom work um, wherever God would have us be. Thanks. Good morning, Reedy Creek Baptist Church. It's the Windies here. Hi. <laughs> At least three of the four Windies um, coming to you from the um, crisp blue mountains where we've now um, settled um, at uh, my mum's house. Um, one of our windies happens to be actually right at the moment in the Gold Coast, would you believe that, enjoying some warmth. Um, we just want to give you a quick update on how things are, are going with us. Um, the kids are in a wonderful Christian school. It's actually my old school um, and they're actually back at school, which is even more of a wonderful thing because um, they have had eight weeks um, doing online school back at home. Um, we thought we'd left all that behind, but no, it came back to us as it has from, from many. We are so grateful how God has provided for us in the most amazing ways, well in advance. Um, before we even came here, he had set the path in for our work. Um, Scott is working with a uh, sports facilities company um, and his work will involve him building the business in Asia um, and communities around the sports facilities as well. So it's um, his work in Cambodia has really paved the way for that role. Very exciting. Uh, for myself, I started doing research with the Cambodian diet with the university um, two and a half years ago in Cambodia and I continued to do that. Um, what, I, what I have started doing is a PhD um, in that same thing. So our work um, and ministry does not stop just because we're here uh, in Australia. We continue to work um, in Cambodia from a distance. So, yeah, we've joined a church uh, here in um, the Blue Mountains and it's wonderful to be, a be able to make new friends and reconnect with old friends too um, that were here before. Um, and just to update you on Mum as well, she's um, doing, doing okay. She uh, continues to receive treatment for leukaemia and she's stable. So, yeah, so thank you for remembering us. We miss you guys. Um, we miss being able to see you, um, but we know that we are connected and we do love hearing from you. So uh, when we can come and visit, we, we would love to, to see you then. So enjoy um, your service and um, hope to see you soon. Bye. Throughout this series, Jesus the Game Changer, our kids have also been having their program. And so thank you very much to Alex and Sarah Kovac and their girls for hosting and producing this wonderful series for our kids. Here's a snippet of what they've been up to over the past six weeks. This is going to be amazing. Jesus the Game Changer, He turns death to victory. Jesus the Game Changer, serves His way to supremacy. He's God's image, He's God's son, He's the head, He's number one. It so this, um, we're going to start a new series this um, now, this Sunday today, and it's going to be uh, a six-part series called uh, Jesus the Game Changer. He decided to listen to God. And not just listen, Paul decided to spend his whole life telling people about God and God's son Jesus. Paul knew if he was going to tell people about God, he better get to know God. Paul found different ways to get to know God. This week's joke is, are you ready? What kind of lights did Noah have on the ark? Floodlights. <laughs> Hi guys, today I'm going to be reading... Jesus said, the time has come. God's kingdom will soon be here. Turn back to God and believe the good news. To sacrifice, change a nation, change a life. History has made it plain. Jesus changed the game.
Welcome back. I'm Sarah, and this is our second week of Jesus, the Game Changer. I hope you had a great week, and you got to have a think about some of the things that we talked about last week in week one of Jesus, the Game Changer. We're looking at who Jesus was and what he's asked us to do with his followers. Our Bible reading today is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But the Holy Spirit will come to you, then you will receive power. Then you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, and in every part of the world. That's it. Hi guys. Today I'm going to be reading from Acts 16, verse 25 to 30. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, if you guys are bored at home and looking for something to do, why don't you try and create your own obstacle course in your house? But make sure you ask mum and dad first. Hi guys, I miss you all. Shout out to all my friends and everyone else at church. God's story the good news. So part of God's story is about the gospel, or the good news, and it goes like this. Lucy Kovac, contestant number one, and Olivia Kovac, contestant number two. Welcome guys, how are you? Good. <laughs> what did William Tyndale devote his life to making happen? No. Oh. Olivia? <laughs> wrote books in different languages so other people could read them. Correct. Yay! Danas ćemo se danas ćemo naučiti kako da pričamo u drugim jezikama. Oh, hang on a minute. That's Croatian. You guys need me to speak English for you to understand. You see, I never even thought how much of a problem this could be until I started to think about um, what we're talking about today, the translating the Bible. Hi, well, I hope you've been having an amazing time during COVID-19. I really hope your church can come back soon because I really miss you all and seeing all your faces. Um, I just wanted to finish in prayer, so if you could please close your eyes today and say the Dear God, I just hope that everyone that's not believing in God can start believing in Him and trusting in Him, and I pray that we can get more Bibles out. It's so amazing, Jesus' friends told everyone they could find about the good news. And those people told other people. And those people told other people. And on and on, and that's still happening today. In fact, you just heard the good news, and the Bible says, <clears throat> If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, it was awesome to hear about Hudson Taylor. Even though he died over a hundred years ago in 1905, it was still great to see how he served God and how he gave up pretty much everything just to do the most important thing and that share the good news of Jesus. Hey guys, it's Raj here. How are you going? I hope you're having a good day and enjoying our online church services. I'm going to lead us in prayer now. Please join me. Dear God, thank you for allowing us to come together. You can share the good news anytime, anywhere with them. And you don't need to use big words and you don't need to know exactly what you're talking about and have it all mapped out how you're going to spread the good news. Jesus the game changer, he turns death to victory. Jesus the game changer, saves his way to supremacy. He's God's image, he's God's son. Good morning and thanks again for tuning in to Reedy's online service. We're so glad that you can join us again today. I've just got a couple of announcements. First of all, I just want to say thank you 
to the church because a few weeks ago I raised the issue that like most churches around Australia during this pandemic time most of our churches offerings have gone down and likewise our churches offering has gone down by about 15 percent and when I raised that a few weeks ago I said if you're able to if you're in that position just to give just a little bit more uh, we would really wel welcome that well you did and I want to say thank you very much because the past few weeks our offerings have been really encouraging so thank you very much for your ongoing support also for our church community we sent around a survey because on uh, about mid-July we are planning to come back according to the government regulations and we're going to have multiple services on Sunday. In fact we're looking at three multiple uh, services and we're asking for your preferences. If you haven't had the opportunity yet to complete that survey please do so. The link is down at the bottom here on the on the screen. God is up to something and we are looking forward to seeing what he is going to do in and through Reedy Church, but also a lot of the other churches around the area. Thank you. God bless you.
there, would you please join with me in prayer and many other people that are also watching this in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to pause and just give you thanks for your most amazing grace and mercy. Because out of your grace, out of your amazing love, you sent your only son, Jesus, into this world to die on the cross for us, to save us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood on the cross so that we might have forgiveness for our sins. Thank you for all that you've done for us, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you did not remain in the grave, but you are today alive, sitting at God's right hand. Thank you for your most amazing love and grace. Father, in these times we continue to come before you, Lord, with great sense of humility, recognising that you are indeed the great God, the God who continues to show your love for us. And so with that, Lord, we come before you and pray that you will be with the incredible medical staff, not only here on the Gold Coast, but around the world, who are treating so many people, Lord, with this virus and other medical needs. Please protect them and have your hand upon them. We continue to pray, Lord, for a vaccine. Continue to be with those people, Lord, who are trying to, to lead us during this time. So we do pray, Lord, for our government leaders, both state and federally, Lord. Have your hand upon them. Lord, the world seems to be pretty crazy between various world leaders and so on. And we just pray, Lord, for calm, for peace. Lord, particularly in places where the church and other minority groups are being persecuted, we do remember them, Lord, and just pray, Father God, that you help the Christians to hang in there with their faith and continue to be a light for you in some pretty dark places. Lord, this morning we heard from some of our uh, former missionaries, Lord, and I thank you for them, Lord. And, and we just pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon them and they've asked for direction and that you'll come and meet their needs, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness over uh, a number of years. We pray, Lord, for our current missionaries too, Lord, and we thank you for what they are doing in bringing your word, planting churches, helping the vulnerable, Lord. We pray too, Lord, that you be with our chaplains as they navigate through these challenging times, Lord. And I pray that they'll be a real source of hope to the students that they reach out to. We pray also, Lord, that you'll be with the many teachers, Lord, not just at Hillcrest, but around our country as, as all the school children are now back. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll protect each of these people in our school communities, Lord. Look after them, and I pray, Lord, that this will be a positive experience for them. We continue to pray, Lord, for our church, that you help us, Lord, to be a godly influence, Lord, not only through our missionaries and chaplains, but through all of us, Lord, in our places of employment and leisure at home. And I pray that you help us, Lord, to be renewed by your Holy Spirit and through your Holy Word. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation who need a touch of your healing hand. We continue, Lord, that you would just be with Janelle Fraser and with her family, particularly her dad at this time. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Shirley Cook in the last remaining days or weeks of her life. Thank you, Lord, for her faithfulness. Continue to be with Elaine too, Lord, um, during this challenging period and be with her family as well. We thank you, Lord, that Tony Woods is at the end of his treatment. And we pray too, Lord, that you'll be with Tony and Barris as well. We thank you, Lord, that uh, there's been some good news with Noel Simpson too and minister to him and his family at this time. Father God, thank you for your love and grace. Help us to be people of godly influence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. This, uh, this morning, I want to introduce to you a special guest. We've got Scott Pilgrim joining us from Melbourne. And about seven weeks ago, 
he started a new role as the Executive Director of Global Interaction. Now, GIA is the Australian Baptist Mission Organisation. It has a focus on long-term and cross-cultural missions. Scott, it's really good to have you on with us today. I'll tell you what, you've picked a great time to start a new job in global missions. Yeah, that's right. Uh, great to share with you today. Yep, certainly my plans and the way that I envisaged how I would start at Global Interaction has been very different. Uh, starting in the midst of a pandemic. So, yeah, stretching and challenging, um, but also been, um, been a great opportunity to kind of connect and build team in the midst of all that we've been facing together. We've just started a new um, preaching series on Jesus, the Game Changer, to the ends of the earth, and we're doing that in conjunction with our May Missions Month. Why, why should Christians be involved in cross-cultural mission? I guess two things stand out for me. Uh, one, one, I think there's actually... Um, uh, if you like the, the the Great Commission, there's the, there's our missional mandate, uh, and so, yeah, you know those words can come off our mouths all too quickly and all too easily, but there is Jesus' mandate to take the good news, the gospel, to uh, you know, to all the earth, to the ends of the earth, um, and I guess you'll unpack that. Uh, as you work through the game changer, both what does that mean in Reedy Creek and locally, and what does that mean across the world? I think the other thing for me is the justice lens. So there's, a, if you like, the, the, the Great Commission or the missional lens, but there's a justice lens. Um, and this has always been a tipping point for me in terms of stepping into the role. Um, about 3.2 billion people around the world today, about 40% 40, uh, 40 of the population still, haven't heard the good news of Jesus in a way that makes sense to them. Yeah. Um, and the, the last sentence there is the key one. Uh, they haven't understood the gospel in a way that makes sense to them. Uh, you know, we take it for granted. I get up this morning. I know I've got a, a good house to live in. I've got hot water. I, I've got electricity. I've got resources. But beyond that, uh, I actually have the capacity to understand and hear about Jesus uh, in, a, in a really free society and with everything I take for granted. And suddenly I'm struck by the fact that 40% of the world still haven't heard the good news in a way that makes sense to them in their culture. I yeah. find that pretty uh, pretty challenging. Yeah, I wonder. Um, there's heaps of different missiologies about how to go about evangelism. How does global interaction go about getting people to understand yep. the the message of Jesus in their own context? Yeah, re really good question. Um, really good question. So we would say, you know, our distinct, our, our distinctive, or at our core, um, is the fact that uh, one. Uh, we we want to be working in places where the gospel is yet to take root. Um, we, we might talk about least reached people groups. Um, so we're, we're trying to work in, in, in places, uh, be they uh, urban areas or rural areas, where particularly uh, in countries where there are many religious, uh, civil, historical barriers to the gospel. Um, there's a little, uh, if you like, a good metaphor, I think, is that that passage in Mark 2 where the friends bring the paralysed man to Jesus yeah. and they can't get him in. And if you like, as a metaphor, they can't get him in because there's so many barriers. So what do they do? They innovatively, they creatively, they imaginatively get him through the roof. And at our heartbeat, global interaction wants to break down barriers that would stop people, prevent people from hearing the good news and uh, we do that in so many different ways around the world uh, by word and deed. And, and that's really our heartbeat. And then to empower those Jesus followers to form faith communities that reflect their culture. Yeah. That, don't look, that don't look like Crossway where I go to church or Reedy Creek or an American church or an English church, but look like an authentic church in that community, in that culture. And we're just seeing some amazing stories of God at work forming emerging faith communities in the places around the world where we work that look like the culture those people live in. When I was growing up, the missionaries were like the superhero Christians. I mean, you had your pastors and they were pretty spiritual, but then you had your cross-cultural long-term missionaries and they were crazies. Uh, who are these people that go yeah. over <laughs> to yeah. these places? Yeah, I think I think we've all grown up with that. Uh, we've all grown up with that stereotype. Funnily enough, I was just talking to one of our workers the other day, a young guy in his thirties, um, working in Southeast Asia, and um, he was saying how he used to read books about you know, some of the the great missionaries. And now here he is, and he said, uh, "I don't see myself as a great missionary." And uh, these these are kind of I think his words. I'm just an ordinary bloke who loves Jesus with a real sense of call to be where I am. 
Um, I like the phrase, the mission of God in the hands of ordinary people. Um, that, uh, that's a phrase that relates to people living on the Gold Coast to follow Jesus in Melbourne, where I am, or in Malawi and Mozambique, where we've got workers. Um, it's the mission of God in the hands of ordinary people. Uh, and we've got people who are teaching English. We've got people who are helping improve local health outcomes. We've got people working in agriculture, people helping develop social enterprises, people giving dignity to women, people around the world investing in their kind of areas of, of skill and professionalism and expertise. But most of all, uh, most of all, simply, simply trying to live as good neighbours, uh, being real, being authentic, being the hands and feet of Jesus. So they're... They're, they're ordinary Aussies and some people from other cultures thrown into that mix uh, and uh, love Jesus and just have a really strong sense of call to be where they are. And just on that to our viewers as well, May Missions Month is obviously uh, one of the main or the main month of focus on global interaction in your ministries and probably therefore uh, where you get a lot of financial support through and that's obviously being impacted too. So for our listeners at Reedy Creek, you can still support global interaction. You can head over to their website um, and hit me up if you can't find it. You'll find it, Google it, it's easy. And you can still uh, support various projects, individuals or global interaction as a whole. So head over there. And can I just say thank you to your church community. Uh, the, the heart of our story are our partners. And so we value your partnership and yeah, great to chat. Hi, we're the Staunton family and we're coming to you from Seam Reap in Cambodia. I'm Andy, this is Kathy. We've got Hugo, Ruby and Charlie on the camera, which is just gonna spin around now, beautiful. And tonight we're actually uh, speaking from their famous Angkor Wat temples, which is about 10 kilometers from Seam Reap which is where we live. These temples are really culturally and historically significant for the Khmer people. They're over a thousand years old, but it's also a place where Khmer people love to come in the evenings to have picnics with their family, to kick the football around and also ride their bikes. So whilst we love coming here and it's one of our favorite places, our real heart is back in the Khmer village where we live, which is called Chiriel, which is also about 10 kilometers out of Siem Reap on the other side of town. And Kathy's gonna tell you a little bit about our life there. Yeah, we love living in Cheerio Village. Uh, it's a little bit out of town, so there's a bit more space. It's a bit quieter. There's no tourists. Um, there's only a few Westerners around, so we really get a chance to observe how Khmer people live. Um, and for us in this early stage in our cross-cultural work, we are spending time observing the rhythms of life uh, in our village. You know, um, what people do at different times of the day, what happens when it's really hot, what happens when it cools down a bit, where do people buy their food, and where do people grow their food and where do they sell it. Um, so we're really enjoying being part of all that, and the kids are really enjoying um, being country kids for a bit. Which is good. So some of the things that we've been doing in our three and a half months that we've been here now, obviously we've been severely impacted by the COVID-19 virus like the rest of the world. So when we have those little moments where we think that uh, you know, life's a bit tough for us. We just got to think about you guys back home who are going through exactly the same thing as us. But during this time, we've uh, completed one uh, phase 1A of our language learning, which is all about listening to the language. And we've learned something like about 800 words so far, which uh, our minds sometimes feel a bit full and a bit jumbled, but it's amazing how you pick up language along the way, which is really fun. The kids have settled into school. They did about two months of schooling at the local school here. And for the last month and a half, they've been in homeschool environment, online learning like the rest of the world also. The other thing that we've been doing is we've been setting up a bit of a strategic plan for our team as to the best way that we can impact uh, the town of Sam Reap and the people of Cambodia so they come to know uh, Jesus in a way that we know him, as someone who uh, provides hope and peace and love to us in a way that no one else can. The other thing that we'd like to say is thank you so much for all of your support back home. Um, you're obviously faithful givers, but also more importantly is that we know that you guys are praying for us. We've received so many emails and messages along the way, uh, you know, showing your support for us. And not once have we felt uh, left alone, even in those really tense times about a month ago where uh, it was looking a little bit precarious here with the state of emergency being put in place and a few other things. But we thank you so much for your support. We uh, love hearing your uh, regular news from back home and love sharing our news as well. So thank you so much. And um, yeah, we, we hope that you've enjoyed our little email, uh, our little video, but you can also contact us in a couple of ways. 
And that is Kathy. You can email us at Stauntons in Cambodia at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, on our Facebook page, Stauntons in Cambodia. And uh, blessings to you all. Thanks so much. Hi, and welcome back to this week's final episode of World Christian News Series 1. Once again, I'm Jordan Fothergill, bringing news that matters worldwide to us, to you, as God's people. Despite government rules to ban all churches from opening their doors in order to control the further spread of COVID-19 in Kenya, a church in Kenya has opened its road and has taken its services travelling to apartment blocks, allowing people to attend a church whilst being able to maintain social distancing rules that were brought in to tackle the virus. We hear from Pastor Saar from Garba Community Church in Uganda. Hi, Willie Creek Baptist Church. It's an awesome, 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 awesome opportunity just coming to you. My name is Saar. I was with the Mwangaza Children's Choir way back in 2018, if you remember those beautiful kids from Uganda. Right now in Uganda, we have 41 million people, but today we have about 190 cases coronavirus. No deaths yet, so it feels like we're still to a certain level safe. As a church, Gabba Community Church, we decided we'll reach out. So we decided to talk to our friends and also talk to some of our church members who are able to, and we started to contribute. But I want to tell you the need is huge compared to the response, but we're doing something. I really believe that this is a season where the church needs to stand up and take its place in society by offering that support, whether it's a physical, material support, or it's a spiritual or prayer support for the people in the community. So that's the update for me. It's really, really nice to talk to you guys. I hope you keep praying for us. The kids are fine. Most of them are with their families and their homes. And those who have needs, they've been able to come to the church and we've been able to raise some sort of support to help them and to support them in their homes. God bless you, really quick. And it's bye for me for now. Christian Aid are encouraging people to pray for those that have been affected by Cyclone Airfan that swept across India and Bangladesh last week. They also claim they are doing everything they can to help. Once again, I'm Jordan Fothergill, and that's this week's final episode of World Christian News. Hey, it's great to hear what Kathy and Andy are doing over in Cambodia with Global Interaction and really excited to continue to support them and their ministry over there. And this morning is our final week of Jesus the Game Changer. It's been a good series. I've enjoyed it. I hope you guys have too. In 2015, I did hands down the craziest thing I have ever done. I climbed an active volcano and peered over the ledge down into the center of the crater so I could look at the vent. As I was starting the ascent up the mountain, I was you know, somewhat confident, but also a little bit hesitant. Maybe this would be the dumbest thing I'd ever done before. But the plan was pretty simple. Climb the volcano, no guides, no rules, no safety restrictions. It was an exercise of pure adventure. We just wanted to look into it and see what the inside of a volcano looked like. But as the sun set and the night came up, and we drew closer and closer to the lip of that crater. I could see the red glow of the lava reflecting off the steam and the smoke that was rising into the night sky. It was about then that I realized the magnitude of what I was doing. The whole situation was dawning on me. For starters, I'd realized by then that the endless sight of what resembled black sand and was falling like light rain all around me was actually volcanic ash. And the red rock with the most incredible swirling patterns that protruded through from the ash was once a river of molten lava that had flowed from the center of the volcano. Heck, I soon realized that the very mountain that I was climbing, the whole thing was once lava that had spewed out. The danger was dawning on me, but as we grew closer and closer to the top, I could hear what kind of sounded like the biggest vent you have ever heard, sucking and pushing air, opening and closing, followed by the sound of the biggest whip crack you have ever heard. It was so loud that I'm not kidding a second, that you could see the sound travel through the smoke and the steam in the air. 
It was the most unfamiliar environment that I'd ever been in. It was out of this world crazy. And then it happened. The volcano exploded, sending lava hundreds of metres into the air above our heads. And the force of the explosion literally blew us off our feet. That was the most extraordinary experience and I would never have experienced it had I not made the decision to go. The story of the gospel going to the ends of the earth is one that is full of people who ventured into uncharted territories, into the unknown. You know, some people that we've heard about throughout this series got onto boats, others trekked across mountains, they learned new languages, they studied new cultures and they risked imprisonment and some even lost their lives. These remarkable stories of unbelievable faith are also full of one other thing. They were all ordinary people. Too often we set these boundaries and we put limits on ourselves. And yet the truth is, you and I all have the same capacity to step out of our self-imposed comfort zones as they had. A comfort zone is like it's a behavioural space where our behaviours fit a routine or a pattern that minimise stress and risk. Remember those early weeks at the height of the spread of the COVID-19 virus back in March? We were all told to stay home and only leave the house for the bare essentials. Our homes became our comfort zones physically, but also psychologically. When we had to leave the house, our stress levels would increase and we'd become anxious. We certainly didn't hang around for a conversation at the supermarket in the early weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic. We just wanted to get home as quickly as we could because our homes offered us Mental security. Being at home reduced our stress. It reduced our anxiety, you know, that we might get sick. It was our safe place, our comfort zone. Whether physically or emotionally, comfort zones reduce stress and anxiety. We like comfort zones. We like them a lot. In fact, it's actually becoming apparent now that even though the risk of contracting COVID-19 at the moment has significantly reduced, many people are struggling to readjust to being comfortable to leave the house again and to re-engage with people again. Leaving the comfort zone of the house has become a struggle for many. But we can't live healthily if we never leave our comfort zones. Research shows us that if we never leave our comfort zone or push the barriers out, then our world actually contracts and becomes smaller and smaller. And inside our small world, our anxiety actually increases because we spent so much energy trying to avoid the stress and the anxiety that's outside of our small world. That's why psychologists say that it is best for us to push out of our comfort zone, to push the boundaries. We actually function better with a small amount of anxiety and stress. They call it optimal anxiety. And optimal anxiety is just outside our comfort zone. This is where we are the most productive when we operate with optimal anxiety, this is where we are most creative. This is where we deal best with unexpected change and this is where we grow physically and spiritually. The risk is though, as followers of Jesus, that we never or rarely move outside our spiritual comfort zones. The risk is that we become unwilling to let go of idols of living a stress-free life or, or living uh, risk-free. We don't want to leave those spaces in order to share the good news about Jesus and to partake in something that is far greater, something of eternal significance, sharing the good news. In the opening chapter of Acts, we find the disciples together and with Jesus. 
He has revealed himself to them and given heaps of convincing proofs that he is alive. And after Jesus gave his now famous last words, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He then ascends to heaven before their very eyes and the disciples returned then to the upper room. In this upper room was the 11 remaining disciples, the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as Jesus' brothers. We're told in Acts chapter 1 that there are about 120 people in this room and they've been told to stay in Jerusalem and to wait. For some of these followers, I'm sure this instruction to stay and to wait was actually of great relief. It gave them permission to hide, to remain in their comfort zone with an uncertain in future. Many of them would have been very happy just to sit tight. But perhaps for others, this period of waiting was way outside their comfort zone. I'm sure many of them wanted to get on with it. I mean, Jesus had told them what they had to do and they just wanted to get on and be his witness. Let's go, get into it. But regardless, they're instructed to wait for this gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's a crucial component to the mission that they've been given. This time of waiting is actually really important. Sometimes we've just got to wait and that's a message for another day. But I wonder how much the 120 there discussed Jesus' last words while they waited. If they talked about what it means to be his witness all the way to the end of the earth. In the disciples' day, the ends of the earth was likely considered Spain. And so as the gospel moves from place to place in the book of Acts, there is a feeling that Jesus' mission hasn't quite been accomplished. Ben Witherington is a fantastic Christian theologian, and he sums it up perfectly saying, The ending of the book of Acts makes it clear that Luke's purpose wasn't simply to chronicle the life and death of Paul, but rather the rise and spread of the gospel and the social and religious movement to which it gave birth. Luke has provided a theological history that chases the spread of the good news from Jerusalem to Rome, from the eastern edge of the Roman Empire into its very heart. Rome was not seen as in Luke's day as the edge of the known world, and so the reader would have very well sorry, so the reader would know very well that Jesus' mission to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth was still ongoing in his own day. However, for Luke, it was critical and symbolic that the message reached the heart and the hub of the empire as a challenge to Caesar and a gateway to the ends of the earth. The open-endedness that the modern reader senses in the ending of Acts is intentional. Luke is chronicling not the life and times of Paul or any other early Christian leader, which would have had a definite conclusion, but rather a phenomenon and a movement that was continuing and alive and well in his own day. For Luke, Paul's story is really about the unstoppable word of God, which no obstacle, no shipwreck, no snake bite, and no Roman authorities could hinder from reaching the heart of the empire and the hearts of those who lived there. How good's that? The open-endedness was intentional. At the end of Acts, Jesus' mission is still going out and the readers get swept into this great unfinished story. St. Patrick, who's probably the most famous Irishman who actually wasn't Irish, is just one Christian that entered into this unfinished story that began in Acts. Patrick was a young man around the time that the Roman Empire was falling, roughly 410 AD. And at the age of 16, he was captured. He was taken across the sea to Ireland and forced into slavery. And in Roman times, Ireland was literally considered to be the ends of the earth. It was actually called the land of the setting sun. They believed the world dropped off after Ireland. Lots of flat earthers back then. Here is this teenager taken against his will to the ends of the earth and forced into a life of slavery. Talk about getting out of your comfort zone. There's zero doubt that Patrick felt the risk and the stress of being banished to this island that was literally at the end of the earth. So what does he do with himself? Well, 
He devotes himself deeply to the God his father worshipped. He prays. He prays more. And he prayed earnestly. And he prays consistently. And he's in a consistent relationship, a conversation with God. Rather than resenting the situation he's in. And despite the uncertainty, the risk and the anxiety that he must have felt, he develops a devout faith in God. And after six years, something really strange happens. He has a vision and he senses he's being told by God that your ship is ready. He immediately leaves, travels across the island through many dangerous territories where he finds a ship waiting to depart. And after praying, he negotiates his way on board and he is finally free of slavery. But he spends the next 20 years back at home training and serving God as a Catholic priest until another vision changes his future and the course of history. He wrote that an angel continued to visit him, saying that the Irish were calling to him to save them. He was being called back to the place where the people who had enslaved him lived. He was being called to go to the ends of the known earth to minister the good news. And Patrick obeyed. In Ireland, he faced opposition at every turn. He continued to plant churches and spread the good news of Jesus. And he even wrote himself, Now the gospel has been preached to the ends of the earth, to the place beyond which no one lives. You know... Throughout the centuries, the places that have been known as the ends of the earth have just continually been expanding. You know, people travelled into China and Japan, the Philippines, India. Like geographically, the gospel has gone out from Jerusalem to the outermost parts of the earth. But where are the ends of the earth for you today? You know, we can see just about every square inch of the earth from our phones on Google Maps. And we can travel to practically any part of the world and communicate across seas instantly. And yet Jesus' last words are still being spoken to us today. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. It says in Revelation 7, the last book of the New Testament, that there'll be men and women from every tongue, tribe, and nation. When you're in heaven forever, you can still be identified from where you came from. So there's something about that, that God designs and desires his eternal worship to be made up of every tongue, tribe, and nation. Right now, every tongue, tribe, and nation won't be present around the throne forever because they have not heard the good news of the gospel. The ends of the earth is is Jesus' way of saying no one is exempt. This is meant for everyone. Why should anyone on this planet suffer without the beauty and the freedom of these ideas. It's not right. If you've been given a gift and you know that there are people who don't have that, uh, if you care about those people, you'd want to share it with them. When you know that Jesus loves you and your sins are forgiven, you can't help but share it. And so whether that means that you go to another country or you learn another language uh, or you're just talking to your neighbor over the fence in the backyard, there's something compelling about the story that makes you want to share it. Sometimes we believe that the true missionary activity is, is not to find people who've never heard of Christ, but to go to the places where people have known and forgotten or have no use for the gospel. And often that's even in our own neighborhoods or back in our own communities. For me, it uh, breaks the barriers. And uh, we tend to be stay in the very comfort zone. There's a lot of problems, a lot of hurting people in the outside church and outside our comfort zone. If you think about the spread of the Christian faith, it has to spread horizontally from place to place, but it also has to reach across generations. And in every generation, people reframe Christianity according to their own culture. The Christianity of my parents is not the same Christianity as that of my children. So one way of thinking of going to the ends of the earth is the deliberate work to bridge generations. The ends of the earth for most people is right across the kitchen table. How are we gonna speak our message 
to, to these populations that they ju just don't want to know, you know, because they're raised in a very different culture. And to me, that is going to be the challenge of our time. It's to be understood not simply geographically, but perhaps in social, cultural, and economic terms. They don't have to be away from us, but they may be very near geographically, but they are still minority people groups and uh, they feel uh, neglected. Traditional paradigm of missions being out there somewhere needs to be broken down and we need to realize that actually missions begins on our very doorstep, which actually is very exciting because we can mobilize the whole church. I mean, back in Hudson Taylor's day, it was only the few that could go to China, whereas now God has brought China to England, so everybody actually can be involved in missions right on our very doorstep. Not to forget, you know, about those people who do not enjoy this freedom. We live in freedom, uh, but we cannot just enjoy it and forget about those who do not have this freedom. It starts and it finishes with him. There is nothing other than the name of Jesus that is to be held above everything. He offers hope and salvation to people. We're seeing people come to faith in him and lose everything because of it to find joy. I still think there's a really important line between faith and unbelief. And, and crossing that boundary is still a boundary I think Jesus invites all of us to be part of. And taking that good news into new territory in that sense is critical. It is all about people. It's not about the globe. It's not about the geography. It is all about a person who lives in a very remote or it could be even at the middle of a town when he listens the gospel in a language that he understands best the end of the world has started. It's not completed yet, but it started there. Well, for me personally, if what Jesus says is true and what the scriptures say about Jesus is true, it changes everything. Because it means that there is a God who cares enough about me and about everyone that he was willing to die. It means that at the heart of the universe is love. It also means that the universe isn't about me. So like my ego, whether something good or bad happens to me doesn't really matter that much. My job is to love. And my job is to do the best work that I can do on something that I would do that someone else wouldn't. And then I have to let the results be in God's hands. The ends of the earth. It's less about geography in our day, in our modern globalized world. You know, it's about the person that lives across the street because the ends of the earth have, live in our streets now. The ends of the earth. It's crossing the cultural divide, but not just ethnically, generationally, or the difference between our backgrounds, our values, our social norms and expectations. The ends of the earth could be right across from your table. You know, teaching the life of faith to our own children or other family members. You know, the ends of the earth are the hard places, the hard communities where the gospel is particularly challenging. Maybe it's universities or in academia, building sites or in any dismissive culture. The ends of the earth, they're the places that faith has been forgotten, where God's no longer needed. Maybe that's us here right on the Gold Coast. The disciples and the great missionaries throughout history have all had one thing in common. They were ordinary people who made Jesus' last words their first priority. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they obeyed. They stepped out of their comfort zone. They devoted themselves to God and experienced an extraordinary life with God that they otherwise would not have ever had. They had faith. They endured opposition. They've been part of God's ongoing story to make all things new. But what about you? Because Jesus' last words to go to the ends of the earth are as much as written to you as they are to any great disciple or missionary. But the question is, will you make them your first priority? 
Where are the ends of your earth? Or who is God calling you to? Do you even have an openness to go? Are you willing to count the cost? Will you have faith in God for the results? Now, if you're serious about making Jesus' last words your first priority, then I actually I want you to stand. I know it's a bit different and fancily responding online like this, but if you're serious about making Jesus' last words your first priority, then I want you to stand. Whether you've got to speak to a family member, whether you've got to share the good news in, in a distant land either way, I would like you to stand. I mean, no one's watching you. <laughs> Maybe the one person next to you. No one's hearing what you're hearing. And standing really doesn't make much of a difference. But what it does do is landmarks this moment for you. You know, that you are serious about making Jesus' last words your first priorities. You are serious about taking his calling and answering it, taking on the responsibility. Are you standing? Because I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know, I trust there are people standing in this moment and some are standing with a bit of fear. What the heck are they doing, they're thinking. Others might be standing with heaps of excitement there might be some who are sitting that wished they got up and it's not too late, they can get up. And there are some who are sitting and are quite comfortable to remain sitting at this time. But Lord, I just pray for every one of us that you would show us the next step to the end of the earth. Lord, that you would just show us the next thing we need to be obedient in. And Lord, when we see the next step, that we would just have the courage and the faith to take that step. Lord, that we recognise the only thing that matters is our obedience to your call and not the way people respond or react to the good news. So, Lord, in preparation of that step, um, I pray for the people that we're going to. Lord, that they may have receptive ears. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let
favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he's with you he's with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he's for you 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 Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Next week we start a new series called The Roadmap to Renewal. So we'll see you then.